People have noticed recently that um, El Camino along the Stanford border is getting kind of congested with RVs parking along the route. And uh, some people have been asking us, you know, what's the city doing about it? Is this even under the city's jurisdiction? Uh, so, Sue, you went out and talked to, to a couple RV owners this week, and you counted them up too yeah. as well. So, we're talking about between like Stanford or Sarah Street to Medical yeah. Foundation, basically. I, I decided to, to do a count between uh, basically Medical Foundation Way, which is in front of, the, or, or Medical Foundation Drive, Drive, thank you, which is in front of, um, on the opposite, the uh, Palazzo Medical Foundation, and go all the way up to Stanford Avenue, just because that's where I saw a couple of RVs sort of ending, although there are one or two that even go beyond that, closer to our building here towards California Avenue. Um, but the majority are between Sarah Street and uh, Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And they're all along Stanford property. And pretty much there were, I counted, 48 RVs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't include what looked like there could be some other people living in smaller vehicles. Mm -hmm. So I just stuck with the RVs because that's kind of what this was about, the argument was about. Yeah, and 48 seems like a lot, um, certainly. Um, I know that that stretch of roadway has, first of all, it's, it's a state highway. Right. Um, and that stretch of roadway has actually in the past been used for other purposes, like selling cars. People used to park their cars out there with little for sale signs and, uh, until that was outlawed by the state, and then the police cracked down on that. Now it seems like there's a new use for that stretch. Um, are these the same people that you interviewed, um, types of people that you interviewed a couple years ago when the city was looking into the car camping issue? Are they, are they um, staying out there, living in their RVs, kind of for the same reasons, or it's who's really, out there? Yeah, it's really hard to say exactly. I, I would say that they probably are, to some extent, the same people. I mean, although uh, it's, it's a mix. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, I have found most of these people are not saying, well, I can't afford to live somewhere else. What they're saying is, is I, I prefer, you know, I've been living like this for a long time. They're not newly. They're not newly. Living in RVs, no, not so. newly living in RVs. The ones that I've talked to, but there were many. You know, I think I was able to reach about five people who would actually talk to me mm -hmm. the other day, and there. That's not. That's a pretty small percentage out of the forty-eight that are out there. So right, I want to right. do a little bit more research yeah. before I say exactly who it were is that's out the there. The five that you talked to were they from Palo Alto, or had they? A couple of them were actually yes, long-term Palo Alto residents. One had been here since nineteen sixty-seven and does not want to leave the area. You know, I mean, he has lived on boats, he's lived, uh, you know, he lived in Alvi. So one of the things that has happened to him on multiple occasions is he's kind of been, he won't use the term pushed out because he was compensated for leaving when the, when the cities took the property, his property, meaning the boat, or closed down the, the um, harbor where he was at. Uh, through eminent domain, basically he was compensated and with that money he bought an RV. Uh, but we're talking about there are veterans out there and he is also one. We're talking about retired people, high tech, high tech workers who are not working anymore. There's a variety of, of reasons why people are there. There's even people who are working like a contractor I talked to. That's what example. I wanted to ask you about because you, you had a comment on your story in Town Square, somebody saying basically that this person believes that the majority of the RVs belong to construction crews who are there temporarily to do work on Stanford campus or whatnot. Have you seen any evidence that that's the case, that there's some people who just come here for like a project? And uh, well, I mean, there's only one person I interviewed that said that he was he was a contractor and, you know, he was kind of cagey about what he's doing too. He, he, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the thing is getting to, getting, digging down deep enough to really find out what people are really all about is a difficult thing. Because you know they they have to be cautious, and mm -hmm. so and they don't want to reveal that much about themselves. But I would say that it's a mix, and and he may be a contractor working at Stanford. I don't know. He didn't say that at this point. I want to go back and interview him again. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't say that it's all contractors. It's but, a whole range of people. Yeah, I think this person suggests it's construction workers, like not like you know, not like a freelancer or anything, but somebody who's come here to help build for a bit and then. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that before, that um, there'll be a yeah. project and someone's home base may be Modesto, and they don't want to be driving back and forth every day, so they have a camper of some sort, and then they're here 
do their job, then move on to the next. Well, I simply don't gonna, have enough uh, information to really yeah. say that at this point. I mean, I think there was even a comment about, uh, uh, I had another story where somebody said, well, a uh, previous story in 2011 that I wrote that had to do with um, car campers, and somebody said, well, the majority of them are criminals. Uh, and so, you know, it's like, how do you know that they're criminals, you know, and, and I don't think you can, we can make generalizations until we actually have the facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. the city went through this whole um, exploration of should there be a car camping ban or regulation or restrictions. In the end, there was nothing done about that, correct? Yeah, well, what no, happened no was, is it, basically, I think it was around 2011 that they started looking at it, and yeah. then I believe it was 2013 that they put, it was August 2013 that they actually voted for a ban. Um, however, they stated in December of that year because of a case coming out of Los Angeles. Right. And eventually the L.A. case, the judges ruled that it was, I believe it went to an appeals court, a small uh, section, like three panel judges, who basically said, uh, this is, it's arbitrary, it's vague, unconstitutional, and it basically singles out a class of people, not anybody who's done anything illegal. And so the city backed off on its because its um, ordinance was very similar to the LA ordinance. And I do think it's great that you brought up that conversation because that was the one point, uh, you know, since I've been covering City Hall, where you actually have had a few, uh, you know, quite a few people who live in RVs come out publicly and speaking to the council. So you do get to learn about some of the people in their lives and yeah. why, why they live the way they are. And I don't think any construction workers came. It was mostly people like you described who maybe chose this because uh, it's a cheaper option, maybe it's the only affordable one, maybe they like the lifestyle, maybe they've been doing it for a while. So there was kind of the sense they get. So just, just based on that, it seems like the construction uh, component may be there, but it's probably not the majority, it's probably... Probably not the ones showing up at city council meetings. Yeah. And yeah. The, other, the other aspect of this is when you're, when you're dealing with people who sometimes, I'm looking at, you know, general, I'm afraid of stepping into a generalization here, but people are not always going to tell you the real reason why they're there. There's right. pride factors, you know, there's there's a whole aspect of status in society. Maybe people, people have disabilities, mental illness. So they may just tell you, oh, I chose this lifestyle. You know, this is what I want. But it isn't necessarily so. And I found out that was the case when I did my interviews in 2011 for my cover story then, is that you had people who had fled, you had women who fled domestic violence. There were people who obviously had mental issues. People had physical problems. You know, there's a lot of depression out there. People are not able to function necessarily. But also there are, um, there is a sizable population of people who were tech workers and maybe lost their jobs. Uh, you know, I'm finding this to be the same thing, that there, there are people who had very good jobs and for whatever reason they're not able to work now or they couldn't find work and, and also there's a big squeeze on housing. That's another issue. Lots of questions. So it seems like it's an ongoing issue since you talked to people in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, but have you seen an increase in the number of vehicles parking on the streets or has it stayed pretty much the same? Okay, so, you know, without uh, empirical evidence, I can only, there's nothing to compare it to. Uh -huh. um, and one of the people that I talked to who lives in his SUV had actually suggested that the city should hire some uh, students from Stanford to kind of analyze where people are coming from and where were they a year ago, where were they two years ago, uh, just to see if the numbers have increased. It does appear that the numbers have increased. Every time I've driven up and down El Camino, I certainly didn't see the numbers that I'm seeing now. It's really obvious. And just as kind of a comparison, in 2011, the city, when I wrote my story, then the city guesstimated that there were between 12 and 24 people living in, in RVs mm -hmm. on the city streets. Uh, people who lived in the RVs said that they estimated there were more like 50. So if we're talking citywide, now we're talking about just along El Camino, there's a minimum of 48 and probably more people living in vehicles but not necessarily RVs just along that one stretch. And there's other so, yeah. areas where there's a lot of RVs too, yeah. like near Bolware Park, mm -hmm. you had somebody mentioning San Antonio, right. again, yeah. Town Square. Yeah, so I mean, so the, I would say the numbers have gone up. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I found it interesting that uh, the city and some of the um, vehicle dwellers are talking about there should be a regional approach to uh, accommodating uh, people who are living in their RVs. Uh, providing maybe access to water or access to you know, showers or something like that. Um, how would how would that work, how, and, and who would be paying for that? Okay. Well, um, I think let's just step back just for a second and talk about what the city plans to do right now. 
and that is that they want to Which enforce, was in your article. Yes, they want right. to enforce the 72-hour um, uh, parking restrictions that, that apply to anybody in the city, that you yeah. can't be in one spot for longer than that. But and you're, being in one spot includes being anywhere within a five-tenths of a mile zone. You've got to move outside of it. a half mile away. Yeah. yeah, and so these people are basically saying, well, yeah, we'll comply. We'll just move. Move, you know, half a mile, and that's it, you know, yeah. and we'll still be... So you're, you're really not going to leave. Yeah, um, and so, so maybe there doesn't need to be a regional approach if people are just going to move a half mile. Well, I think what the, what, um, the city is also looking at is when I talked to Jim Keene, the city manager, he said that they are looking at a regional approach because they don't want it to be dumped all on one, one city and... Mm-hmm. and so how do you get people to be less visible? It's a matter of scale. You know, if you have just a few people that are in RVs, it's not as noticeable as when you have 48 lined up on, on one street. So just to be clear, the problem they're trying to solve is right. making these people less visible? Yeah, well, um, no, I don't want to, I don't think we want to go there. I thought, I thought that's what I heard. Are there actually problems that, that, that are affecting people other than visible visibility? I mean, are, are people afraid or are people being affected by the dumping of sewage or, or what I'm not have you? hearing that from anybody at this point because mm-hmm. it's not these people are not in the neighborhoods when when the RVs are parked in the neighborhoods I heard more concerns about you know I saw somebody dumping their sewage in, 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 from a bottle into the trash you know or, or uh, there might be someone use my garden hose or uh, my children are afraid because there, there's a strange man in a van parked in front of the house or something like that. On El Camino, there's much less of that. There's just a sort of a physical presence that one person said at a community meeting that I went to. I used to be able to enjoy the roses that were along the fence at uh, on Stanford's property because this is against Stanford. Now I can't see them because of the RVs. So it's sort of like, yeah. How dare they? Yeah. Like, so sorry. you know, the, this is it's the visit. It's sort of the uglification of El Camino, if you can call El Camino a beautiful spot to begin with, but it's, it's just kind of made it look worse. So um, the city is actually looking into, I think Mountain View is looking at a, at a model that came out of Santa Barbara. What Santa Barbara does is they took and, and they basically took and put RVs all around different designated locations. So there were, um, let's say in, I wouldn't say in, in public parking lots, uh, commercial areas, church lots, things like that. At night, they call it like the safe parking, safe place to park or something like that program. And so they, they were able to put, they put 115 of these vehicles there during nighttime, hired for roughly about $200,000 a year. They hired a nonprofit who would provide basic services, so anywhere from outreach coordinators to try to get people out of their vehicles and into supportive housing to um, showers and also to make sure that there weren't any safety issues, you know, like fights or anything like that breaking out. Is that still going on? Yes, it's been going on for more than 12 years now. So Mountain View apparently, when Jim Keen was looking at uh, doing something, maybe doing something similar for Palo Alto, um, Mountain View apparently and San Jose both looked at at the Santa Barbara model. Uh, in the brief conversation I was able to have with him the other day, I haven't been able to check out to find out why this is yet, but apparently uh, in both cases they, they didn't find the model would work for their cities. It just wasn't doable. Maybe the spaces aren't there, couldn't get help to coordinate. Yeah, there was, there was talk about the Santa Barbara model when the city was dealing with it a few years ago, as you mentioned, and I think that was one of the key challenges, finding actual sites that yeah. would accommodate them. I think there were two churches that kind of volunteered, right. or at least one. There was one in College Terrace. Right. Uh, but, and but Peninsula we, Bible Church also on, on uh, Middlefield Road. But there were, but I think there were like almost no uh, any other takers were kind of in short supply, so right. I think lack of space is one big issue yeah. Right. Pursuing, has, pursuing that kind of model. city hasn't talked about using any of its own lots or, or garages or anything like that, as far as I know. Do you, have you heard them say that? No, I think the right. city's... I think the city is very stringent about its garages and the fact that there's already a huge parking shortage, and I don't right. think they want to convert those for, any, yeah. for anything but parking. But yeah, it seems likely that since the city already went through the car camping discussion, which took two years and explored various angles, that there would be anything at this point that would be proposed that hasn't already been looked at. I mean, we've got the city staff who are enforcing the parking regulations and city manager who's maybe talking to some of the other 
city managers. But I, I do feel like the tenor of the conversation changed a little because back then I remember there was talk with the Santa Clara County, like the health officials. There was talk about uh, more subsidies for like kind of for social services, things like that. And here it seems to be the conversation is they're blocking the view of some roses that yeah. some resident wants to look at. It seems like. It seems like the problems they're looking at are a little different now than well, they were back then. Yeah, but even, I mean, then it seemed like the problem was more of a concern of neighbors and safety and whatnot. For the so Carmelie area. Yeah, yeah, so I would say, like, like, then there was a great effort to address the problems that were being surfaced. Here, if there are no great problems that are being surfaced, like it's even less likely that the city's going to be doing anything other okay. than enforcing yeah. the parking. Yeah, well, it was kind of interesting because when I talked to Jim Keene, he said that they are. They have been looking at maybe. I, I think they do believe that there's an increase. And he even told me when he was in Berkeley that he found that there were about forty percent of. They had, Berkeley had forty percent of the um, vehicle dwellers in the entire in, in all of Alameda County, and it was disproportionate mm. to the to the number of residents that lived there that yeah. would let's say be be homeless. So it was. It had become a magnet because they were mm. very lax, and so. He, he's concerned. He doesn't want Palo Alto to become that. He realizes that it is an ongoing issue. There has been in this, what's going on right now is they are doing outreach with the county. The county has come in and gotten in touch with about one third. They've been able to make contact with about one third of the RV dwellers to try to offer them other services. So that is still happening now? Yes, that okay. is still happening. So they haven't, they haven't taken that off the table at all. Okay, and, and it's, it's just a matter of, does it really work? You know, does a 72 hour, um, warning to move your car somewhere else and outreach services to people who either can't access them or don't want them, is that going to get rid of the problem? And it doesn't appear that it is. It's probably it a carrot and a stick situation. Like, you can have outreach to somebody, but if there's no stick of, at least, you know, we're paying attention to you, move your car, then it's very easy to just say, I'm fine, go away, I'm just going to stay here. Well, the people that I talked to said, well, we'll certainly comply with the city rules. We understand that this is city property. It's their property. They can tell us to move. But under the law, we can move a half a mile away or we can move into the neighborhoods. And they said, hey, there's plenty of parking in the neighborhoods. You know, we can go there overnight. Well, not so those you, neighborhoods now. No, but I mean <laughs> other neighbor. Let's say citywide, there's other neighborhoods they could go into at night um, and or hang out in or be near a park or something like that. So it doesn't, it's just shifting the problem around. And I think that that's one of the things that the city is concerned about. Um, Jim said, it's really a very complex issue. I, you know, let's talk about what the complexity is. Why does Santa Barbara's, why is Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara's wor model working in Santa Barbara, but it doesn't seem to be working anywhere else? I think that's a good question. You know, what else, what other options are there out there? There must be something. Yeah. And he says he is still approaching it from a regional standpoint and talking to other cities. Okay, well, that's a good note to end on. Um, thanks, Sue, and we'll look forward to what you have uh, in addition to this reporting. All right. Uh, that's it for this topic, and uh, we will see you next week. You can subscribe to us, like us, and follow us on social media or paloaltoonline.com. See you next week.